you can't really do it in vivo. It's not that, not that easy. I mean, you certainly can't do it in a human eye. And uh, the rhodopsin has to be considered in many different lights. And so we take a look at it by putting it onto an inorganic semiconductor. Let's just use gallium arsenide. It doesn't really matter, but it's attached to a man-made inorganic semiconductor. Put the bacteria rhodopsin up there and take a look at it. You shine light on it. What happens? A conformational change in the protein occurs. So far, so good. And then it's detected by the inorganic semiconductor and then amplified for eventual detection by man sitting somewhere in the laboratory right now. Well, that's nice. And this helps to give us an idea of how bacterial rhodopsin works and helps to uh, get us some answers. So this has been suggested thus far. Uh, rhodopsin is very well known to be uh, packed in into our eye. Why is that? Because if you've got a whole bunch of rays emanating from the back of the room and they are all parallel, and they're going to hit the wall behind me. How many of them are, am I going to intercept? Very few. No matter how fast I run back and forth, I'm not going to intercept that many. The ones that I, uh, I detect, great, but most of them are going to go to my right, to my left, to the top. They're going to miss me. And therefore, I need to do something. I need to clone myself. Now, no matter how unattractive this may sound to some of you, if I cloned myself and spread myself out, I would be able to detect more. Why? because these rays are going to be parallel, and I've now increased my detection level. It has been suggested by German researchers this is the way it has to be. The insect is so ridiculously sensitive, they must be packed in there. The odorant receptors must be packed. So they take a look. Immunolabeling, they're not there. Find a few. There's nowhere near what uh, we uh, needed, and so this is a problem. As a matter of fact, we found more other proteins than we found of the putative odorant receptors. Sensory neuron membrane proteins are found in a higher concentration than the putative odorant receptors. This is a problem. What is going on here? If based on the current paradigm, I've got my sensilla, a pheromone comes in, it's going to impact at a specific point. That specific point is going to be right there. It's not going to be on the other side. It's only going to be at that specific point. That pheromone will go through a pore at that specific point. That pheromone will then hit the dendrite very close to that particular point. It's a point effect. Is this the way an antenna works? No. An antenna works. If you've got an electromagnetic frequency and the antenna is detecting it, it is not a point effect. The whole antenna will light up in a more or less uh, fashion like this. So if it's based upon antenna theory, which I'm espousing right now, you're going to have a different way of detecting it. A conductor is a substance or body capable of transmitting electricity, heat, or sound. The antonym would be an insulator. But a semiconductor, any of a class of solids whose electrical conductivity is between that of a conductor and an insulator. And this is what we're dealing with right now. Or at least that's what I'm proposing. A protein semiconductor is a semiconductor, God bless you, with a protein constituent. A protein constituent. So proteins are able to detect electromagnetic frequencies, well-known, great field going on out there. So I told you we've got a response time of one millisecond. One millisecond equals one million picoseconds. Uh, the researchers have taken a look at this. Upon the absorption of light, there is a shift of electron density in rhodopsin, which begins the photoisomerization process in about 1.6 picoseconds, as measured by a 500 femtosecond laser. Well, that's great. That's plenty of time. I mean, now I've got a mechanism that works within the time period that I need, which is one millisecond. How long does it take to recover? It's about 300 milliseconds. What about bacteria rhodopsin? Resets itself in about 10 milliseconds. Well, this is great. This again gives me plenty of time because 98% of it is going to be reset in just 20 milliseconds. So it's fast detection. It's fast recovery. This is looking good. It has been shown. Now, for some of you, you may not think, well, this is, this is nice, Tom, but this is, I need some more evidence. Can you give me something more? I'd be happy to. It has been shown that upon strong illumination, Rhabdomyoreal skeleton shows structural changes. So they take the light and they hit the rhabdom hard. This causes structural changes in the cytoskeleton. It's a very interesting response. It's not really uh, seen that much, but it's an interesting characteristic. Kumar and Kiel, two German researchers, have found that pheromone stimulation, not just any stimulation, but high pheromone stimulation, induces cytoskeletal changes in olfactory dendrites of the male Saturniid moss. Beautiful. I've got another connection. Let me give you another connection. G protein coupled receptors. Proteins belong to many different families. One of the more common ones are the G protein coupled receptors. They are known as seven transmembrane alpha helix structures. They pass through the membrane seven times. The G protein coupled receptors that I talked about in human olfaction, 
is the same thing as what you find in the insects. The odorant receptors are the same. And so what I'm proposing on this last slide right now is that when the pheromone molecules get close to the sensilla, they light up as detected by protein semiconductors. And this is how my theory is now being put forward. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions, and I already see one arm raised. Francesca McCartney. Hi, Francesca. Hi. Would you comment, or do you have a comment on Luca Turin's olfaction research? I'd be happy to comment on that. Luca Turin's olfaction research is based upon the vibrational energy the same as the insects. The problem is that Luca Turin's theory looks at electron tunneling, which is a fundamentally different theory than the dielectric antenna theory. And so if you take a look at how these two mechanisms line up, they don't. They're still looking at the vibrational energy, but it's two different ways of looking at the vibrational energies on the two. Even though I support what he's doing, and I've communicated with him, we don't have much to talk about because we're looking at two different things. Uh, next question over yes. here. Uh, Glenn Ryan. Uh, Hi, Glenn. I assume that bugs can smell in the dark. Yes. So your theory requires light activation of the semiconductor mechanism. No, I never said that. Oh, because you told us a lot about how light activates the semiconductors. Uh, so that's one half of the question. The other half of the question is, uh, why do you need an intermediary protein molecule to act as the transducer when electromagnetic fields can directly affect receptors, at least in mammalian systems, and an electromagnetic field can propagate right through the whole uh, yep. center part of whatever you called it and activate the cytoplasmic receptor. Yes. Uh, it is still possible that that is happening. The reason why I consider that unlikely is because the neuronal response is so clean and so basic that it, I do believe that a protein is allowing ions to enter. A neuronal response is all about ion interchange. Calcium influx was talked about in uh, Lucas's talk earlier on. There's really nothing different here. And therefore, you're going to need a protein in order to have ions come in and uh, set the uh, normal neuronal response. So therefore, I do believe that proteins are involved. However, it's not necessary. Um, uh, is short antenna theory, uh, small antenna, mm -hmm. much smaller than uh, wavelength, resonant antennas part of this? Uh, no, actually. Uh, these antenna, or sensilla, are set up at about the right uh, wavelength uh, for the infrared frequencies which are coming from the vibrational molecules. Now, as you know, they don't have to line up perfectly, or as you may, I'm not sure what your background is, uh, but they don't have to line up perfectly. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one, -one, but it has to be pretty close, and they are close. Good question. Good antenna question. Can you relate this to the, um, the way the dendrites on neuro, uh, neurons in the brain work? Related to with the way neurons in the brain. Actually, yeah, actually, uh, this is a question which is outside the, uh, uh, my talk. Uh, it would not be easy to do so because the vertebrate neuron is much, much, much simpler than the insect neuron. And I'm so happy to say that. It, uh, <laughs> insect neurons are far more complicated. Vertebrate neurons are very simple. And they're just, you know, you'll have, you know, billions of them. Whereas the insect neurons, because there's only a few hundred thousand of them, uh, are much more diverse and have uh, very different capabilities. So to make a comparison, I just can't. I just can't. And I'm sorry. Tom, on your last slide here, it seems to me you're showing pheromone molecules <clears throat> directly stimulating the antenna, but surely you mean some electromagnetic emission or property of the ligand stimulating the antenna. Can you explain what you mean exactly? Well, not a ligand in the sense that there is binding. Ligand would suggest binding. Yeah, yeah, what these are, these are pheromone molecules that are impacting the outside of the sensilla. What I am saying is that the pheromone is not actually getting inside the sensilla, which is a necessary prerequisite in order for the dendrite to detect it according to the current theory of insect olfaction because they need the lock and key. That pheromone needs to get in there. With my system, it just needs to get on the outside of it or in very close proximity, set off the antenna, and boom, the antenna lights up in this beautiful display that I've set before you right now. Uh, Jim Beekler, couldn't you test this by getting rid of the pheromones and finding the resonant frequency and just hitting the antenna with that resonant frequency and see how the insects react? I uh, can't do that. Great question, though. Uh, it's been talked about for many, many years. The reason why is if you take a look at the vibrational frequencies of a given pheromone molecule, there's more than one. There's more than two. There's more than ten. And so uh, the insect, uh, we know, is not responding to a single frequency. It's detected.